Hello everyone and welcome to my new video. This week I will be painting my version of Ash Stoppo's DTIOS who are on Instagram or Draw This In Your Style. Um, I fell in love with her character and <laughs> practically begged her to make <laughs> an art event, um, which is a bit cringe, but um, I really loved her design and it gave me this instant idea of this storm goddess plowing through the clouds gracefully but just all these sort of clouds billowing out around her. And also I wanted to play with lighting. Um, lighting and the lightning were gonna be a huge challenge because obviously lightning lights up quite a lot of um, the surface area of the subject. So learning where to put the shadow and create the effect of this lightning strike slashing across the page uh, was a real challenge, but an exciting one. If you don't know Ash's work, um, please head over to Instagram and show her some love. Um, she recently reached 2,000 followers and this was just to celebrate that milestone. So I just want to wish you all the best, Ash, and congratulations. And I really, really loved the piece that you made for this challenge. So you'll have seen earlier that I was um, wetting the paper before I painted and I've taped it down with some gum tape. And that's because I've recently realized that this really helps me with washes, with making them more even. It helps me avoid back runs while I'm painting. And normally if I'm painting sort of larger sections of skin, like I am in her the top half of her body, um, that can be a real challenge sometimes on truly dry paper. So I soak it with some water and let it expand a bit, tape it down, let it dry, and then it's ready to paint on. Just one piece of advice though, is that um, if you're worried about pencil lines, then you need to remove them before you soak the paper, because otherwise the water sets the graphite into the paper and it's very difficult to erase. So make sure you've taken that step if you go along um, the same route as me, basically. So I laid down my initial wash and um, it was nice and even, so I was very happy with it. And then the next step for me is building out a map uh, for me to follow. So I normally start with the redder areas, so around eyes and lips, nose and ears, tips of fingers, um, and any blush I want to put on shoulders. And this is really important because I remove quite a lot of pencil before I paint. And sometimes when the layers build up, even though watercolour is transparent, um, the lines can become a little bit blurry and a bit hidden behind all the layers. And it's very difficult then to know where um, the edges of noses are or where the bags under eyes end and where the joints in fingers were in your sketch when you figured everything like that out while you were drawing. So painting down a wash and then layering over those first initial red layers really helps me to understand what the limits are to those areas and then I don't go over them when I'm painting um, for the rest of the piece. For the next step, I want to make my skin tone mixture darker, um, and this is to be able to build values. So you can already see here that the face is um, very well lit underneath, and the shadow is on top of the bridge of the nose, on the top of the cheekbone, behind the jaw, on top of the forehead, um, and on top of the hand as well. And by building these values bit by bit and darkening my paint with every layer and building up very, very slowly, I start to build up a very gradual, very soft map of where I want the values to go. And I don't have to commit fully with a really dark color. I can just build it up very, very, very slowly and very gently. And then once all that's done, I just make sure that I deepen some of those values. Um, this is probably about halfway into creating the values and actually you'll see later that I go over it again because once I've painted the clouds and the really dark night sky it makes her skin look a little bit paler and the values lose their depth against the white paper it looks fine but when there's Payne's grey and black in there it's not so good so um, yeah this is a good start and you can always build on it um, add to it as you're painting if you use this kind of technique um, because nothing's ever sort of set in stone. You can continue to build those transparent layers. I 
I think the hardest part for me was creating a softness to the clouds, especially the ones against her skin, because I wanted this really harsh shadow against her chest, because the lightning's going through her hands, in between her hands, and so it would throw quite a sharp relief of the shape of the cloud against her skin. And to make the edges of the cloud appear soft, as well as creating a well-defined line, was actually quite challenging. Um, but rewarding at the same time, you know, I, I kind of feel like if you're not pushing yourself to work out a technique with every painting, if you're not showing your growth um, with every new painting, then um, that's fine, but I, I like to challenge myself, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't like not being able to do something, or I don't like not being able to think about how I might approach something. So doing it is always, always the best option to learn something. Because I can sit there for months thinking about how logically I might approach the layering of clouds and the layering of shadows and stuff in this piece, but realistically, the quickest way that I'm gonna learn this is just by doing it and trying and failing probably a couple of times. You know, I'm quite sort of well known for um, scrapping a painting more than once <laughs> to get exactly what I want from it. Um, I'm my own worst critic, I think every artist is, and I uh, really take the time sometimes to consider what isn't working and whether it's salvageable or not. And it's okay if it's not salvageable. It's not wasted paint, it's not wasted paper. It has very valuably been used to teach you a lesson. Um, and that's how I like to think about it. Um, it. It takes some of the stress out of creating from me and helps me to just say, okay, you know, it's a failed attempt, but you know, I can move on and <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. <laughs> I think my favorite part of any painting is when the um, subject is pretty much done and then adding these details like the valleys in the nostril, the black around the eyes, um, just in the corner of the mouth, um, that's when the face really starts to come into focus and adding eyebrows of course, <laughs> but that's when the face really comes to life for me and is a really exciting moment in my process. So here I really Earlier on, you'd have seen me masking out the lightning strikes, which you cannot see on this paper right now. Um, but I'll show you at the end during like the final swoop. So although clouds would technically be white under this lightning, I want to leave really high contrast areas of white of clouds. But I also really need to show off the lightning strike somehow, you know, the cloud and the lightning can't both be pure white. So I've mixed Payne's Grey with a little bit of um, yellow and this just adds a kind of slight murkiness to the clouds where it's quite crisp in the white. Um, the Payne's Grey areas of the cloud are um, really beautifully shadowed and just because of the colour I mean and the kind of muddier colour just fills in the area in between. And so while that's wet I also want to start um, laying in some Payne's Grey for the night sky. And the key here is to do it on the paper when it's wet so that you get a blurred and feathered edge to the edge of the clouds above and below that peak of the night sky. And this requires a few layers. So at first I just go over it and block out where I want the night sky to peek through. And it looks relatively pale, you know, it's quite a light grey. And then as you start adding more and more paint, um, to the center of that bar that I've painted, it becomes blacker and blacker and blacker right in the middle, but on the edges there's this really, really soft gradient caused by painting wet and wet. As the paint travels out towards the edge, it transitions pretty seamlessly from very, very dark Payne's Grey, very, like, um, very dark valued Payne's Grey, into the whiteness of the cloud. Um, and that's the effect that I'm trying to achieve with this, is just a real softness to the piece, despite her quite intimidating stance and the fact that there's a storm raging around her. I really wanted the softness of the clouds to balance with that kind of um, feeling so that it wasn't all harsh.
And as I'm painting, I'm really enjoying seeing the masking fluid um, block off where the lightning strikes are and strands of her hair blowing in the wind. And then this bit, I'm just dabbing away some of the wash, which I can do because the paper's still wet, but I just felt that it looked a little bit too rectangular and not organic enough, so I wanted a kind of swooping action on the left-hand side of the page. And naturally, paper dries, um, and it can dry quite quickly, so I'm re-wetting the top of the painting again, so that I can essentially use the same technique as I did in the little strip to her left or my left, <laughs> as I'm editing this video, um, and build out a big um, feathered black top edge to the painting. Um, I wanted to create this kind of oppressive heaviness up above her so that she was really kind of reaching up through the clouds and it kind of showed how large she is, to put it really bluntly. I really wanted her power and size to kind of really come across in this. So the fact that her body is poking out above the clouds, I think really emphasizes that. So while I'm painting the clouds, I'll turn the music up a bit for you and you can just relax while I do essentially the same techniques I did before. And I'll be back when there's something else to talk about. This part is actually something that I hadn't really done before. I'd always used a dragging technique to make the clouds. I'd never used a wet and wet technique. Um, so dragging being laying down the color and then using clear water with my brush to pull it away from where I'd put it. Um, but yeah, this I'm kind of dabbing in and actually laying over this second, um, and actually laying over the second area of Payne's Gray was really helpful because you can see a really clearly defined white shape to the main body of the cloud. And then I'm making sure that I'm leaving some of that paler gray from that first layer of building values around the edge of it. And that creates the impression of the kind of vapor around a cloud. So it becomes wispy and soft. And this was a learning moment for me. You know, I was talking about that earlier, that you know, by just by doing, you're learning. And it might be an accident, it might be really intuitive, you might just 
you know, your brain just goes, yeah, I know how to do this. And your hand reciprocates and, you know, it works out and uh, it's great. I mean, the challenge there is then replicating those results. But that's, you know, the point of practice and us keeping painting as artists. So yeah, I really enjoyed seeing these values build as softly as they did. Um, it was like one of those out of body experiences where I was like, oh, I think I figured out how I want to paint clouds. It was a really nice moment. And then at the moment, they kind of, you know, the edges might look okay, but they kind of look like amorphous blobs. <laughs> so I'm adding some extra shadows just to build some of the form of those clouds and make them feel like they're more 3D and that they're really wrapping around her and pushing right out into the distance as well. So they're a little bit darker in the background. You can see on the left of her head, I've washed that with some very pale paint gray just to give that a sense of depth that that's not being as well lit by the lightning as the clouds right in the foreground. And again, this kind of technique just requires patience and timing as well. So you kind of got to keep an eye on how wet or damp your paper is. And that really just comes from learning and doing. As I keep saying, you know, you just kind of, you just got to kind of learn how watercolor behaves on paper of different wetness and you learn to control it a lot better there. So this is why a lot of watercolor artists say, yeah, you just gotta make mistakes and <laughs> learn how to correct them because you can't really teach somebody something that is so unpredictable. You can go some way towards it. You know, I try my best on this channel, but inevitably every artist is gonna come across their own struggles with the medium. Um, and some artists embrace it and really celebrate those back runs and the hard edges and they make incredible art that way. So you've got lots of stuff to kind of explore and see, okay, well, I like that mistake as part of my signature in my art. So I'm going to keep doing that because I find it visually pleasing. I definitely felt at this stage that there wasn't enough of a contrast around the edge of the clouds in front of her. And I wanted to really reinforce those shadows um, reaching up her body. And so I just add some more skin tone um, in a much darker solution and then blend it out with clear water. So that's the dragging technique that I was talking about earlier. So you put down the clear water next to the paint and it just pulls it into a really smooth gradient. It's um, one of my favorite techniques. And then just a couple of finishing touches on her skin, just to make sure that those values are as deep as I want them to be. And then I move on to the Jelly Roll pen. Um, I also made a really big mistake while I was painting this painting because her hair is supposed to be white and flowing down um, across her right shoulder, so towards the left of the painting. And I was really cross with myself when I realized that I hadn't allowed for that white space because the hair on the top of her head is the pure white of the paper. It's not been touched with any watercolor. And I really wanted to keep that strong white throughout her hair. But I mean, I just, at this stage, I was really happy with her apart from that one element. And I was not gonna start again for that. <laughs> I mean, normally I'm more stubborn than that. I mean, really, I'm more stubborn than that. I would have chucked it in the bin, but but yeah, I decided, I made the executive decision to paint her hair with white ink and see how that looked. And actually it kind of took on this like translucent look at the bottom, which I kind of liked. It kind of looked like her hair was glowing. And so I just decided to embrace it. I think line work, aside from filling in the details in the face, is probably one of my favorite things to do. I used to do this with colored pencil but recently I've been doing it with a much more heavily saturated mixture of the skin tone, just because it looks a bit softer, a bit more sophisticated, I think, for my style. And I can still get that variation of thickness with the paintbrush in the creases and deeper corners and darker areas of folds and things like that in the body. So yeah, I'm quite happy with that at the moment. Before I show you a big swoop of the painting so you can see all the details, I just want to say a huge thank you for watching, but also a massive thank you to my patrons. 
uh, their support means that I can make more content and hopefully one day make the transition to being a full-time artist. So I'm just so grateful for everything. And if you'd like to consider being my patron, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash finelinernerd to find out more about what rewards are included in your membership. Thanks again so much for watching. It really means everything, just that anybody would watch any video that I make. Um, and it really pushes me to make more. So until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.